begin this afternoon with Matthew chapter 7. I guess everything's Psalms today, you know. Matthew chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which say, By hearing you shall hear and not understand. So they hear it, but don't understand it. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So in this verse, as we take it as a read, if they did actually hear and understand and saw. Matthew 7, 14, 15. Isn't that right? No. Oh, I wrote down a scripture, but I'm reading it from my, my uh, so Matthew, where would it be? Would that be 77? Maybe somebody could look that up. Let me just read it again and just listen. But you, maybe somebody could look up. I obviously wrote down the reference wrong. Jesus had said, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah. Which say, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. So the issue isn't whether they heard it. What is it? Matthew 13. Chapter 13, here, let me write that. Yeah. Huh. Seven and 13 aren't very close. So. Okay. Yeah, four, verses 14 and 15. Okay, so let's just follow that. You had the right line. I had the right verses, just the wrong chapter. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, what say, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes are closed, or have closed. Thus at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. There's quite a contrast there, isn't there? That conversion is a result of being able to see, hear, and understand, isn't it? But a person can actually hear and see and not understand and not be converted, which is exactly where most of the Jewish people were, okay? And probably most pro professed Christians today, okay? Because, I mean... The Bible says the whole world wanders after the beast, except for a remnant of people. So the question is going to be is, what are some of the things that would wax gross the heart? Is that a fair question? I mean, it's not a matter of them not hearing. It was a heart condition. And because the heart was in a certain condition, they actually couldn't understand what they were hearing. Unbelief. Unbelief, okay. There's a lot of things that could wax gross the heart. But almost anything of a worldly nature would lessen the ability. So it's important for us to pray, Father, is there anything in my life that would lessen my love for you? that would lessen my understanding of your word. Is that a fair prayer? Because it could be just about anything. 
anything that could put, potentially separate us from Christ is something that we must let go. Would you agree? That we may understand the Bible right and be converted and be that people God's waited for for a long time. I mean, he's, he's ultimately waited for this group of people for 2,000 years. Let's see if I got the next one right. Let's see. Mark. You probably don't even believe me anymore. Mark chapter 12, verse 24. Mark 12, verse 24. So Jesus is speaking to people of faith. Or professed religious people, right? And he would say, do you not therefore err? Because you know not the scriptures. Not that you haven't heard the scriptures. But you don't know them. Neither the power of God. And to me, I think that's almost kind of frightening where we are today as a church. We can hear scriptures. And really not know the, the power of it's the only explanation why we're still here at Sense 1844. It's not that we don't have right doctrine. But there's a difference between knowing what it's really saying and experiencing the power of that. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And Jesus is particularly speaking to which group of people religiously? The Jewish nation, isn't it? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Second Corinthians chapter 3. What did I say? I said, maybe somebody might have come up here and just... I'm afraid to ask you if you've ever had a speaker who gave you so many missed scriptures. No, 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 we've never had anybody quite like you. Uh, second, if this is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Huh. I'm in my own little class here, aren't I? But their minds were blinded. Isn't that an interesting way? If you just take it as it reads. What was blinded? Their minds were actually blinded. Have you ever heard a statement like that? Yeah. Your mind is blind. <laughs> until this day. Until this day remaineth this. It's the same veil untaken away in the reading of the what? The Old, the Old Testament. Testament. So it was there. The truth was there. Which veil is done away in Christ? But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon your, their heart. Now, I find it kind of interesting. What was the veil that darkened their mind that they couldn't see? Yeah, accepting Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. And then until they would do that, their mind is actually blind. They can't understand. Will never possibly. And this is why, go ahead. I was just going to say, is that why most of the Christians are blind? Because they don't see the sanctuary and the need to be It'd be a, a number of things. Like I said, I think every pill of our faith is rejected by the majority of Christianity. The law, understand the second coming of prophecy, um, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the state of the dead. I mean, you go straight down the line. And it's like, Wow, there's a lot of blindness out there that's affecting people's ability to even understand the word. Now, there's an, and there's no way of under, there's not a, a way of understanding some personal things, you know, prayer and things like that. But they're all over the map when it comes to the end time event, which is why Jesus in Matthew 24, when the disciples said, "Well, when are these things going to happen? The destruction of the temple, the end of the world." And the first thing he says, do not be deceived. Because there's a lot of deception about end time events. Yeah. Oh, logically would fall in one. 
one, which is what happened to our pioneers. One truth led to the other. But the key really was the sanctuary. Okay. So we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, and taken in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So the veil, they had to be able to see Jesus as he was. And until they really saw Jesus as he was, there was no possibility for them to grasp the scripture. Just not possible. And ultimately, God could do nothing more with them and would have to start the church. I mean, you think of all the apostasy from the time of Moses to that time, and he still had them as his people because they were the only people who had the oracles of God. I mean, where was he going to turn? He's going to go to the Philistines and the Egyptians. Even in all their apostles, they still had the truth. But by the time Jesus comes, in their rejection of Jesus as a nation, not all as individuals, but as a nation, he could no longer use them as a nation. So we have to see, this is where evangelicals get it wrong again. Because if you say, who's Israel? They're going to say, it's the Jews. But clearly God could not long, use, longer use them just on reading these verses as it, it reads mm -hmm. because there's no possibility they can understand God's word. Mm -hmm. And he had to start the church because the only way he could take a group of people further from that point on is by their acceptance of Jesus. In John chapter 7, <laughs> and that number... Is 28. John chapter 7, verse 28. I'm really proud of myself. I got that one right. <laughs> then Christ, then Jesus said, or Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me. And know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he, the, speaking of the Father, that sent me is true, whom you know not. So speaking to them, they knew him, and they knew from where he was. What did you think Jesus meant by that? That they knew him, and knew where he was from. What did they know about? No, he was from Nazareth, or Bethlehem, the mother, the son of Joseph and Mary. You're the carpenter's son. But I didn't come of myself. But he, speaking of the Father, sent me as true, whom they didn't know. They didn't know him. I want us to look at some other things. Oh, and before we look at this one, this is John chapter 6, verse 38. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on is, is one of the main reasons why the Jewish people did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And it's all based on human tradition. But in the Mishnah, when I say the Mishnah, I'm not talking about the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. The Mishnah is a, a, is a collection of, of Jewish writings, oral traditions, outside the Bible. And it would just be one legal argument after the other. Um, it was just volumes of material. And I, and I, I, I get you, I, it's either that they never mention the Messiah and all of that, or it's but, but a few times. Now, in different ways you can say God. You can say Yahweh. You can use the word for God, which is El, E-L. A God name for God in Hebrew is Elohim. E L O H I M. And anytime you see an I am on the end of a Hebrew word, that's the plural. Like boy would be boyim. Not that boy's boy in Hebrew. But if you put an I am, an I am on the end of a word, it's like us putting an S on the end of a word. Like from boy to boys. They would just put an I am, boyim. Anyone want to take a guess? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning, who created the heaven and the earth? Elohim. The plural. And right off the bat, the very, very first sentence of 
the entire Bible is telling you that God had a helper. God the Father had a co-worker. Because, and in the beginning, you could say God's, in a way, created the heaven and the earth. And that doesn't sound very good for us, does it? But the word, the name God, is the plural Elohim. Elohim created the universe. And the implication is, and I can tell you, Jewish scholars stumble over this. They'll do everything but admit that there's more than one person in it. They just won't accept that. And by not accepting this very plain, very plain word is why they rejected Jesus. He could not possibly be equal to the Father. You could not possibly be I am. You could not possibly be who you say you are. All because they didn't read the Bible or take it just as it reads. In fact, if that wasn't bad enough, in this entire chapter where God's name is mentioned 30 times, all 30 times says Elohim. Now the word for God in the singular, El, is in the book of Genesis, but not in chapter 1. And what that does, and what it helps us with, is that means the writer of Genesis, which is Moses, had available to him a word in singular for God. Meaning that he could have been inspired to use the word El, God, in singular, in Genesis 1, but was never inspired to. But it was a word that he was familiar with, a name for God that he knew, that he could have written, that wasn't inspired to write. He was inspired to write Elohim, the plural for God, implying there's more than one person here. Which Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 tells you there's more than one person. Let us. It's the perfect complement. I mean, you, you would say, with the word name Elohim, how could he have used any other name for God other than that when it says, let us make God in our name, make man in our name? That by not accepting that truth and doing everything but every possible somersault in your mind is one reason. I want us to look at another passage. This is in Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Now you and I know that when people try to prove Sunday, a man-made tradition, they're only going to want to look at certain verses. There's going to be a lot of passages they're not going to want to look at. And, and so when you, when you take that and you look at Proverbs chapter 8, beginning with verse 22, let's just look at, take it as it reads. Let's just say here. The Lord possessed me in the beginning. the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains of fire, abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I, I was brought forth. While yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depths, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountain of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment when he appointed the fountains of the earth. Then was I by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus, who clearly existed before there was anything. The Bible gets a little clearer than that, doesn't it? Not only was he before everything, he made everything. In fact, there was nothing made that was made except by him which would include the space and time. He created time. He created sacred time, Sabbath. He created all time, all space. I, I, our minds can't comprehend, well, what was before he created space and time? Well, 
we can't go there. Our minds can't comprehend that, and that's okay. But more than the human mind can even begin to contemplate, <laughs> we're not even close. God created a universe. <clears throat> we can't say zillion, billions of billions times billion. This has been before that. It's eternity. We can't grasp that. And Jesus was one with the Father from eternity. It's, it's an impossible concept for us to grasp. But we believe it because it says it. Because it, it ultimately would have to be that way. Otherwise, Jesus would be created, right? And that's okay. It's, it's okay that we can't explain it. We're just, we got finite minds. And there's just some things about the universe we probably will never understand or could never possibly understand. And that's okay. But we can understand what our purpose is in our creation. And we don't want to go where Lucifer went, where he was not satisfied with what he knew. He, he had to investigate something that God had not shown him. And a lot of people get in a lot of trouble, even in our time, don't they? Trying to search out that which is not possible for us to know. Something that God hasn't quite yet revealed. In 1 Corinthians, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. See if I can get a string of right references here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 30. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You know, to the Jewish mind, in verse 23, Christ crucified, why would that be a stumbling block to the Jews, Christ crucified? Yeah. You know, so you... you you don't believe that there's more than one, that God couldn't have had a co-creator, though Genesis 1 proves that beyond all shadow of a doubt. You just take it as it reads. But because they say there could only be singularly one God, and they base that on Deuteronomy, I think 4 verse 6, the Lord our God is one God. One Lord. And is one Lord. Six four. Well, I'm just a little dyslexic, <laughs> which doesn't help me at age fifty-seven. That looks like seventy-five. Okay, six four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, it's, a, it's, it's an actual question. Is this a plural? And the answer is yes and no. What the word in Hebrew here, one, is the word echud. And it's used elsewhere, for example, like Adam and Eve became one flesh, echud. But becoming one flesh is not numerically one when it's really speaking about two people becoming one. Does that make sense? Adam and Eve, echud, became one flesh. But there's two people. So the Lord our the Lord our God is one Ichud Lord. The whole implication of this particular word that we really have to talk about more than one person. What's the word for God? Uh, that I'm not sure. You have to look that up. But even if it wasn't the word one, as used elsewhere would imply that we're not necessarily talking about one singular personality, but log logically two personalities who are one in purpose. 
one in how they rule the universe. And of course, we can't emphasize how much that error on the part of the Jewish people has meant to them throughout history. If the rejection of Jesus wasn't bad enough, that rejection has led to a, a terrible history for them. I mean, millions of Jewish people have been murdered because of this. Um, just the pogroms in, in Russia, there'd be millions. And Nazi Germany is tipped to millions. The Jewish people, uh, even closer to the time of their rejection of Christ, a million died in the siege on Jerusalem. And they lost that with that came a lot of bad press about them, even from the Christian world. But it, where did it all start? With one erroneous human tradition, just failing to read the Bible just as it is. Well, I tell you, friends, I, I have no idea. As, as I was preparing this, I've never actually done this sermon before. I'm just kind of looking at this for my first time myself, and it's like, it's, it's just, it's mind-boggling to think of what one error can do. You know, I, I, you know, I think of my life, and I'm so thankful God led me to set down this church. Because I, 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 right now, I'm just trying to think, where would I be? Where would I be? If I didn't hear about the Sabbath's truth in the Adventist church, I have no idea where. I don't even know if I'd be a Christian today. I would like to think I'd be a Christian, but I, what if I'd be on the wrong side? What if I'd be persecuting God's true people in the end of time? And I didn't even know it because of some erroneous doctrines that I held to. Huh. And you just think about it. Just how, so I know God led me to this church. And I think, you know, as I think about my life, if I just steer off course here a little bit, to be so fortunate to be able to be a, a, a co-speaker with Ron Spear. I mean, there's, there's only, you can only count on your hands how many young men had an opportunity to go around the world speaking like this. Or to, to get to know Dr. Standish well. And I think of how many people don't know that. Now, they, God may bless them with other people. But there's a blessing that comes with, if you just want to know truth, God's going to put you on the right lines of knowing truth. And God's led every one of you to this place. You know, God started West Salem. You know, I don't think, you know, I was, I was, up, I was up in Battle Creek last Sabbath. And we, we stood by the tombstone of James and Ellen White. And uh, we walked past the house, which is part of the grounds there in Battle Creek, where they had lived from, I don't know, 18, you know, up to 1856, somewhere in there. And you just, you start looking at the room where she was. And if you think about, back then, that was probably the holiest spot on as the angel of the Lord was guiding her to write, you name a more sacred place in Earth's history at that moment. You, there's no way you can come up with that. And just to think, you know, and I don't want to make it a relic, you know, but what a privilege. And then you go there and you say, no, I, I want to reaffirm my faith to be part of this movement. I mean, they gave it all. James White gave up his health, gave up his life. And it's like, you know, we need to be the ones who cross the finish line now. It's not going to take less dedication, it's going to cost us more. And 
this is this is this is real stuff. And uh, we have to be so so vigilant. And uh, but anyway, and and just to know fellowships like Lighthouses, uh, West Salem. There's some beautiful groups out in Washington. You know, all these things enrich your life. And when you can go somewhere and have reaffirmed those conservative views and to know, you know, this is right, this is the right thing. Because you can go to a lot of places in our church, you're not going to hear the same thing. Let's look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 11 through 13. <laughs> Who's correct? I think I got four in a row. <laughs> For this count. For this commandment, we got to talk about which commandment that is. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that thou shouldest say, well, who shall go up for us in heaven? And bring, us, bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Well, who's going to go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? In other words, Moses is saying, Look, you don't have to wait for someone to come down from heaven to tell you. You don't have to wait for somebody else to go all the way across the sea to come back and tell you because the, the truth of the matter is, you already have it. You know, you already have it. But the commandment, the commandment. Let's turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 7. And again, this is all just reaffirming that the Jewish people had, they had all this light, they had the truth, there was no reason to reject Jesus. None whatsoever. And if you ask, the proof of that, the obvious proof that the entire Jewish nation could have accepted Jesus is the fact that if only one Hebrew had accepted him, that one Hebrew believing in Jesus would easily represent the entire nation that could have believed as well. Isn't that right? If one person had the same scriptures and found Jesus, then everyone who has those same scriptures should find Jesus. That there's literally no excuse. So we're in Romans chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speak it on this verse. Say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. You know what was spoken about in Deuteronomy by Moses was really referring to what? According to Paul. What did they understand in Deuteronomy as taught? As explained by Paul here. That in those words of Deuteronomy, that they were taught the first advent of Christ and his death. Isn't that right? That's exactly how he's interpreting Deuteronomy here in Romans. He's taking those very same words found in Deuteronomy, and he's explaining what they in reality had as truth back then. That there was a Messiah coming from above, from heaven, the Messiah, the Christ. Go down into a grave. They knew that. It was all there. But if you don't want to believe that, if it's mixed with human tradition to know the Messiah is going to be a, a general dis destroying the Romans, well, then it, it messes up your whole understanding of the Bible. And so, you know, here we have evangelicals believing they're all going to be raptured out. And not a one going to have to face what's in chapter 4 of Revelation on. You realize how dangerous that is? That's a very dangerous doctrine. Dominionism, which was something that Ted Cruz believed, was that Christians are actually supposed to rule during this time. A lot of Christians, Pat Robertson, you think of all these big evangelical type people, Pentecostals, who believe, along with the Catholic Church, that before the end of the world, they're supposed to actually control the world. Dominionism. 
it's well believed within evangelical circles. That justifies everything they do politically. Everything they do to gain city hall, to push for the presidency, for anything, because they believe they're supposed to believe. Well, then we believe, oh no, we're to prepare people for the soon return of Christ. Those are two completely different ways of thinking. It, 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 it's an eternal difference. And it matters what you think. It matters what you believe. It matters what you read and what you watch. And so many of these people, they get into these, these ruts of thinking, all these erroneous things that, man, I, there's not enough time today to talk about all the things they believe that aren't true. And I feel so sorry for them. And yet I know that most of God's people are in those other churches. Ellen White's very clear about this. Because even though they're all wrong on end time events, they still have a walk with Jesus. But guess what? They have to, they're going to have to come out. They're going to have to come out. Because if they don't come out, they're going to get caught up. They're caught up in all these movements. I tell you, I mean, we're really into, I'm going to tell you how. Let me look at a verse here. In the book of Revelation, um, in chapter, Chapter 14, verse 7. First angel's message begins by saying, With a loud voice, fear God, give glory. And before that was to preach the everlasting gospel to the whole world. Saying with a loud voice. And the loud voice is so that everybody can do what? Yeah. Everybody can hear it. Everybody can hear it. But it's going to get a little bit more intense as we come to the close. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 18. And I want you to look at verse 2. And he cried mightily with a... That's not a loud voice. It's a strong voice. And it's not just a voice so everybody can hear. Because by the time we're getting into Revelation 18, and this really is the very last moments of probation. When you have in verse 1, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Has that happened yet? But we're with a loud voice telling the first angel's message. Yeah. But when the earth is lightened with the glory of God, which is the character of God, when God's people are reflecting the image of Jesus perfectly, And he cried with a strong voice, meaning there's like no time left. I'm not just saying it loudly so everybody can hear. I'm telling you definitely that if you don't decide today, you're going to be lost. Urgent. It's urgent. You know, friends, we're going to get to the point where this, this isn't just even a loud voice thing. And we need to be doing that right now. A loud voice, just get out the way. There's going to come a time where it's going to become so intense. And only it's, you would only do it if your life, your face is lighted up with the glory of God. Because without any fear, with a strong voice, you just go up and you tell people you have to do it. This is life and death. And time is just about up. You realize we're going to come to that at some point. Because as soon as those Sunday laws are passed, there isn't a lot of time. And there comes a point where it's not a loud voice anymore. It's got to be a strong voice. And that strong voice needs to come from a group of people who are enlightened with the glory of God. They have a character. Who they, they're going to have to match. The bat, what a power. Do you imagine being part of that? And, and at Pentecost, how many came in in a day? 3,000. Was it 5,000? And that's nothing compared to what's going to happen at the end of time. 
nothing compared to what's going to happen in the end. Millions are going to come in. And there's something about saying it with a strong voice, with conviction, with the character of Jesus, that's going to be so overwhelming and convincing because it will have to be. Because at that very same time, Satan has probably appeared as Jesus. All the apostate leaders are probably performing all these false miracles already. People are probably already lining up at these churches to be healed. Fire coming down out of heaven. And where will God's people need to be? They're going to have to have the glory of God, the character of God, with a strong voice, with such conviction. That just by the sheer way that you say it, they know it's true. You know, there's a difference between me saying, you know, I think the seventh day is the Sabbath. And saying, with the character of Jesus, the Lord's day will come. It's the seventh day, it's not Sunday. And you know you'll be persecuted. Jesus in your heart, how can you not tell them? I want that experience, don't you? I, I want to be there. No generation will have been more blessed than us to be part of that. I'll tell you, friends, there's a, our, our best days are ahead of us. Are ahead of us. We're going to have to have the character of Jesus and be so familiar that we're using Scripture. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. And there's nothing more you can do than that. The people are going to have to make a decision for themselves. But it's going to make it easier for them when they see your life lit up with the love of Jesus. And you don't retaliate. You pray for those who You know, I think that's why X amount of Pharisees, quite a few, I guess, who became followers of Jesus. Why did they become followers of Jesus? You know, when they when they're in the Sanhedrin, they talked about killing them. That's that was pretty bad. But when they actually were crucified, crucified, and they would yell it out, I think many of them realized as they looked at the face of Jesus, and they looked at the jeering. That's a contrast. That's a contrast. The world's going to have to see that. The world's going to have to see that contrast. Um, let's turn to um, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching water what manner of time the spirit of who? Right. Meaning Messiah. Which was in them did signify when it would testify before him the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So Peter is saying, that if I just take it as a read, he's saying that the prophets of old, those who had prophesied in the past, right? Prophesied of the grace that was to Yeah. They heard it, didn't they? They heard prophesy that Christ was gonna come. They heard prophesy beforehand the sufferings of Christ the Messiah. Same word. The anointed one. They heard it, right? There, there, was no, there was no reason to reject a Messiah figure coming who would die. <coughs> because they were all taught this in the Old Testament. That when Christ would come, when Messiah would come, when the anointed would come, he would suffer. He'd go down into the sea and come back up. 
the soul sanctuary service taught that. The prophets taught it. It's all through the Old Testament. It's all there. And it's like they heard it, but they didn't see it. So let's look at John. Now let's see. So let's look at Galatians. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 1. I know we're running out of time here. Galatians chapter 1. In fact, how long do I go? I never remember. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus. Now, the fact that Paul became a believer means that every Jew could have been where every Pharisee could have become a believer. Simply the fact that he became a believer. But the distinction I want to make here is that not only do we want to talk about how you and I at the beginning, we need to be of a prayerful, humble, and teachable spirit. But the other thing I think we have to recognize is that ultimately man can't teach you. You have to be taught of God. And that, that should seem obvious, but you know, it's so easy to fall in the trap of listening to and believing in only that which you can see. This is what people have faith in. They believe in what they can see. That's why the Catholic Church has the great cathedrals, because it's uh, inspiring to just look at the physical object. It's why they have the Mass. It, everybody can see that, but you and I have faith in Him whom we can't see. But you have to believe that. You know, it, it, it can even happen here in Lighthouse. A person could sit here and still only think about what a person said. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. And think about what that speaker could teach you. But ultimately, when I, when I look at what Paul's saying here, he's saying, look, I, I wasn't taught by any man. The only reason I can understand any of this, Paul's saying, is because God taught me. Now, God can use people, but it, God inspires. He enlightens the mind. Holy Spirit enlightens the mind. Let's look at some other verses here. Um, 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 it always happens when I try to skip stuff. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 8. But the verse I was trying to find there in my notes, real quick, but I'm not finding it, but I know it's there. As Jesus said to Peter, when he said that, when he asked Peter, Who do men say that I am? And he says, You're the Christ. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. Now, if we were to take that just as a read, just like the one we just read, we would know that God ultimately is our teacher. And you know, friends, that is the stark difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. The priests are the teachers within Catholicism. But in Protestantism, it's just between you and God. Protestantism has lost that. I mean, I don't even know how many Protestants we can count here. But really, God will teach us? In fact, I want to turn to a different verse here. I want to look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. I just want to take it as it reads. The revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which God gave unto him, unto Jesus, to show unto his, Jesus' servants, his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he, Jesus, sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Where did the book of Revelation originate? Okay. It, I find, you know, this is the last book of the Bible, which Ellen White says all the books of the Bible meet and end in Revelation. And the opening words is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave unto him, his son. Now, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. But it all originates with, with God the Father. You know, when I, was, I did this on Metro, I, I started looking up stuff, and I thought, man, I, I don't know why I didn't see that before. That, that the book of Revelation is probably much like the rest of the Bible. I mean, the last book of the Bible is where all the books of the Bible meet and end. And really, the Father is the one who originates the book of Revelation. And he gave that revelation to his son, which is about his son. And Jesus would then give it unto his angel. So all the angels are involved in this. I mean, God could have just done it himself, right? But it gives you an understanding of the workings of, of heaven. And so Jesus gives it to his angel. And the angel prophecies, no doubt, Gabriel. And Gabriel's now involved in this. In fact... Gabriel says, and he sent and signified it by his angel. Signified meaning signified symbols. So he gives it to Gabriel, and Gabriel does what with it when he signifies? He gives it to John in symbol. Now, I don't know how God did that. But he said, okay, okay Gabriel, we're going so to show John a lot. And you're going to show him these things. You're going to show him the woman in heaven clothed with the sun. You're going to, you're going to play that significant role. You're, you're going to be the one who visually helps him see this. So you're, you're going to show before him, like some sort of panorama, the beast of Revelation 13 and the second beast. Wouldn't that be a cool opportunity to be able to see that in the flesh? I don't know how all that happened. But the Father came up with all this. And we get, sometimes I think we get this feeling that when we pray to the Father, he's like 10 billion miles away or galaxies away. And Jesus is a little closer, and the Holy Spirit's closer yet. But the reality is, is everything originates with the Father. That's what this is telling you. Because God created the whole through, world through his Son. It's still originating with the Father, isn't it? And so when, when we pray to the and then pray to the Father in the name of the Son, the reason I'm saying this is that just by taking this verse, you would say, you know, it seems like the Father's a lot more involved than I thought he was. And then I read this statement by Sister White. It's such a beautiful statement, I don't remember what it was. But she says, there's angels, of course, there's millions and billions of angels. And they're around the throne, and they're all waiting for the Father to do his bidding. You know where those angels are going? They're coming down here to help some suffering human being. And who's sending them? That means the Father knows what everybody's suffering. That means the Father knows everything. That means the Father is, is as much involved in your life as Jesus is, as much as the Holy Spirit is. So when you're praying to the Father, you're praying to someone who gave us the book of Revelation, who sends the angels out to go on their missions of mercy. And to me, that changes prayer. To know that this is a Father that's not far away. No, this is a Father that knows everything about us. And only is waiting as the angels wait for his to do his beckoning. I mean, it's just, if we, if we could just, you know, if we had one second to be 
view that actual reality. It needs to be life changing. Now we have an imagination. God gave us an imagination. And the faith to believe that we can imagine the throne of God and billions of angels. And they're all saying, send him. And he says, okay, angel so-and-so, you go help. Father's so involved with them. And yet I never hear people talk about the Father that way. We don't talk enough about the Father. It's almost as if we pray to him, but he's so far away. A little bit, a little bit detached, maybe. But it's just the opposite. You know, it's amazing what one little verse can do to your prayer life, which has nothing to do with prayer. That he wanted to get angels involved. Of course, John's involved. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. So, is 4.30 our normal? Okay. Ephesians 3, verse 9. So, in verse 7, if we go up to verse 7, Wherefore, Paul says, I was made a minister according to the gift of grace, the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am least than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And notice it says here, and to make all men see. Isn't that an interesting statement? That he was called with particular purpose to help every person see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Wow, there's quite a bit packed in that verse. But before the world was, there was a fellowship between the Father and the Son, of whom with the Son he created all of everything. A fellowship between God the Father, God the Son. And Paul says, I was called to the ministry to help every man see the mystery of that fellowship between the Father and the Son. Now we just discussed why the Jews wound up rejecting Jesus. Because they failed to understand that fellowship between the Father and the Son. The word fellowship here is a word in Greek called koinonia, which means ultimately something that two people share in common. And somehow Paul says, look, the gospel's about the mission, what, what I've been raised up to preach is to help everybody understand a specific thing. If I can help people just understand the mystery of the fellowship between the Father and the Son. How the Son is the, the eternal Son of the Father. And how they are one in divinity, one in purpose. How when the Father chooses to do anything, he always brings his Son into counsel. That counsel of peace. And everything Jesus does is in the honor of his Father. There's a beautiful relationship there of the Father and the Son. How they work so closely together. How they're in a perfect agreement. How they, they are equally divine. And you say, well, why did God raise up Paul and every other minister to help everybody see that? What is it about the relationship between the Father and the Son that if we could just see that? change our whole life. Yeah. And it's something we need to dwell on about a father who's so loving that he didn't want to lose any one of us. But he gave his own son. Let me ask you a question. Let's just say you had two sons. And one of them committed a crime that was of a, such a crime that uh, it fell within the death penalty. One son was going to die for the crime that he committed. But the law permitted you 
as the father to make a choice. You could choose to allow your guilty son to die for his own sins. Or you could choose to have your innocent son die in his place. And you love each one of them equally. So which one dies? You can think about that. But the father chose his innocent son to die for the guilty. The son he had had with him from eternity, who had always been with him. There never was a time that Jesus wasn't with his father. We're kind of newcomers in this whole scene, aren't we? 6,000 years isn't very long when you talk about the creation of the universe. But the Father, therefore, must love us as much as he loves his eternal son, Jesus. Because he chose for us, or he chose his innocent son to die for the guilty. So that you and I would have the opportunity to live with the Father forever. Now, Jesus... The son, the innocent, at the same time, is offering his life for the guilty. Isn't that right? And in Gethsemane, when Ellen White says he couldn't see beyond the portals of the tomb, what does that mean? When he was sweating great drops of blood, he couldn't see beyond the portals of the tomb. He had felt the full measure of our guilt that was crushing out his life sweating great drops of blood before anybody touched him physically, almost dying in Gethsemane, but strengthened by angels. And he felt that separation that the lost will feel in the second death. A kind of separation where you cannot see beyond the portals of the tomb, where there is no hope of a resurrection. realized Jesus was willing to die that death. That he was actually willing to give up his existence. That we could be with the Father forever. Now there was a relationship between the two of them that was eternal that no two beings could be any closer than that. And yet to bring us in to one lost sheep. Of all the worlds, there's got to be billions of worlds that never I mean, there's galaxies that are over 100 million light years across, which who knows how many worlds are within that galaxy. And there's galaxies within galaxies. We, we can't comprehend. I know I've shared this before. If you stuck your hand out at the point of a pin, your finger, and went as far as Hubble could see, or telescope, you would see a, a billion galaxies. And if I moved my finger just so that you didn't even see it move, I just passed billions of other galaxies. And that's what Hubble could see. Imagine what Hubble can't see. Imagine how many worlds there really are out there. And we're the only one lost sheep. The only fallen world in that whole universe. You would think it'd be easy to say, I'll just start over. But that tells you something about the nature of God where he wasn't willing to let go of us. Didn't want to lose the opportunity of us being with him for we wonder, we, wonder, we, we wonder whether we're willing to give up a certain sin in our life. You see, I, I think when, when we do focus on how loving God is and the relationship between the Father and the Son, what is it that we wouldn't be willing to give up to experience the joy about being around the Father and the Son for eternity? I tell you, friends, I, we can only taste it now. But what God has prepared for us, there's nothing in this world worth not giving up. There, there's nothing in this world that could even possibly compare to that joy. And that word fellowship is that God's bringing us into fellowship with himself. 
Have you ever been around people who didn't want you to be part of their circle? People who have been bullied? Kids can be pretty tough on other kids that don't look just the right way or weigh just the right way. God loves them. Well, I tell you, friends, I can't. I, I can't even imagine how much he loves them. And I don't want you to let go of that. Just start every day. Start every day with that. Because that, that, that's the motivation has to be something that motivates our faith. And it's not the church. It's not human leadership. It's not human opinions. It can only be one thing. It would have to be the love of God for us. And if we fail to realize that, we probably won't do great things. Let me just close with this. Doing great things for God is not anything about quantity. Anytime you do something and you give your whole heart to it, whether it's a kind word, a kind deed, it means more to God than if you gave a million dollars to a charity. It's just thoughts of God are not the thoughts of man. And so, in closing again, based on how we started with be prayerful, be humble, be teachable, study the Bible every day, because there's some thoughts up there. I guarantee you right now, there's some thoughts in all of our heads right now to go. It has to be crucified. And when God's got enough people who are purged, we actually get to go home. And we can't wait for others. We just have to be determined that's going to be, we're going to be one of them. And we'll strive. Father, we know that to be truly free, it means a replacement. So we just pray that the Holy Spirit, that we give the Holy Spirit full freedom to change us into all the other beautiful image of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that every day will be a day in which we will learn something new or relearn something. Father, not just to want to love truth, but to love life, that eternal life, which we know, Father, begins with you. So we thank you that we can be in fellowship.